Howdy howdy and welcome to the big episode 50 of But It Was Aliens, the extraterrestrial comedy podcast where we probe. Oh, how we probe. I'm Kevin the Grey and the other voice you heard there is my partner in probing, Granville Moonwalker. You're right, bah. I'm all right, bah. Are you all right, bah? You're right, bah. I'm all right, bah. But are you all right, bah? All right, bah. Good then, bah. But are you all right then, bah? Today, we have a treat for you. We've had a few requests for incidents to cover, and today's episode is our number one request so far. So for episode 50, we wanted to bring this one to you. The site of today's events is also right around the corner from us. So not only are we going to probe the information out there, but yes indeed, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone not included within those categories, we are going to complete an actual site visit and see what we come up with. Former MIBs on tour, if you will, because today we are quite literally going to Rendlesham Forest. Granville, I know you've heard of Rendlesham because not only is it near, but it's the most famous UFO or UAP incident in the United Kingdom, and probably one of the top three in the world. So I'll let you off the hearing of it. You've heard of it though, right? Never heard of it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Uh, Yes, yes. Oh, you've heard of it. Fortunately, this one I have heard of. But do you know much about it? I know bits and pieces. You better not know too much, because I specifically told you to keep away from it. <laughs> oh, it's just what I've known through obviously living near here. Mm. Well, Rendlesham Forest lays between two Air Force bases, RAF Woodbridge and RAF Bentwaters, known together as the twin bases of Suffolk, which is a county just northeast of London and Essex. During the Cold War, the site was home to a fighter division of the United States Air Force, so whilst what I'm about to blow your ears with happened in England, most of the witnesses are American. Teamwork. Before we get into it, does the military involvement give you any initial ideas? America! (laughs) Fuck yeah! No. You just said American and teamwork, so I just wanted to get that out of there. (laughs) You're going to have to try and resist doing that all (laughs) episode now. <laughs> it's just gonna keep on coming to you. Damn it. It's one of those songs that once you sing it once. So do 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 right around the corner. Oh, so, uh, maybe the aliens were coming to uh check our defences. Swinging around for a probe. Ooh. That's like, like, <laughs> that's what they can do. <laughs> Testing the waters as you would. Maybe. See, what I tend to think of, as soon as I think military, I think, is there new technology? Prototypes. Being prototypes. Used. Or is it Harrier jets? Because we've covered a couple of ones, like um, Pembrokeshire School, quite, where something took off vertically. Mm-hmm. Similar, although it didn't necessarily look like it and what they drew. But yeah, that's what I think of. Anywho! During the night of Christmas Day to Boxing Day, well, 2 a.m., give or take, on the 26th of December 1980, to be precise, although sometimes erroneously reported to be the 27th, due to someone making a mistake in their memo to the Ministry of Defence, which we'll get to later, a security patrol near the east-gated entrance to RAF Woodbridge saw lights descending into Rendlesham Forest, a patrol. So immediately, we have several credible military witnesses. The serviceman initially believed the lights to be a crashing aircraft and so entered the forest to investigate. Obviously, these individuals have seen many aircraft coming down and so they'd know what craft looked like in the night sky. It's not often I get to say credible, trustworthy witnesses (laughs) and actually mean it. But are they actual, credible, trustworthy witnesses? I mean, if they are, this is a first for you. (laughs) but you've cried wolf so many times, I don't know how to, like, take this. Uh, (laughs) But these are military. It's a military base. I don't care. You're saying it. (laughs) So I'm immediately sceptical. Okay, I'm not going to call them trustworthy from now on. I'm going to just call them military. (laughs) Military men. (laughs) But you'd think they'd know the difference between planes, helicopters, stars. 
and other assorted crafts. I'm really glad you said Not that. Not saying that a star is a craft. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very glad you said that. But yeah, military men, they're going to... Or Air Force men, they're going to know stuff in the air, aren't they? Mm-hmm. You would think they'd know their aircrafts. If yeah. they don't, what are they doing? So the servicemen, exploring the forest as they moved towards the lights they'd seen, followed the lights for several minutes. As they got near, these military folk could not believe what they discovered. In a small clearing between trees, the military folk were greeted by the sight of a glowing object. The military folk moved closer, but the object rose and appeared to move between the trees. As the object moved, local animals on a nearby farm began going into an absolute frenzy. We had dogs barking, sheep barring, (laughs) cows mooing, pigs oinking, horses mooing. It sounded like the farm had been attacked. Sounds like old MacDonald needs to get his ass out there and control his animals. So why did they not go crazy when it came down? Only when it went back up. Hmm. (laughs) <laughs> you can understand them going crazy as it went up because it would probably create some sort of supersonic sound perhaps we couldn't hear possible on takeoff Something like that yeah or they could have even seen it i guess um, why they didn't go mad as it landed That's, so i've got no idea when it came that yes, so when did. it was on its way down mm-hmm. how fast do you reckon it was moving because if it's a crashing object You would think gravity would pull that down quite quick. So, um, I think initially, as they'd seen the light, it was going fast, but then it slowed down. Like an aircraft would, as it's landing. Would you classify an alien spaceship as an aircraft? Does it fly in the air? Yes. Aircraft. Exactly. (laughs) So the military followed the object, but every time they got near, it continued to move away. A little after 4am, the police attended the scene. The only lights that could be seen by this point were the lights of the Orford Ness Lighthouse, which... Sorry, can I just say, this object is a tease. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Oh, you're getting close, you're getting close, goodbye! (laughs) Oh, you're getting close again, goodbye! Oh, it's so close. Oh, goodbye. It's like when you see on old American TV shows where they put like a hundred dollar note. I don't know what the currency is, like in their total bills. But they put the bill on a bit of string, leave it on the floor with a long bit of rope, and then just keep winding it in. So, Orford Ness Lighthouse, which is of course about five miles away but could be faintly seen, being that it was one of the brightest lighthouses in the UK. By this point, the incident was over. For now. So, they can see the lighthouse. Yes. That's definitely not what they saw earlier. And obviously they knew what the lighthouse was and where it was. Yeah, you'd think... obviously wouldn't be moving down. You'd think if they're now seeing the lighthouse, they'd be aware... If that was what they saw earlier or not, wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say it's very unusual for the military to call the police, but <laughs> you don't know that, to be fair. Yeah, I don't know whether that's standard procedure, if the military call the police. I thought it was the other way, other around. way around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when things get real serious, the police call the military in. But yeah. Maybe it's to cover their own backs. I Different set of eyes, like a different organisation, they can come in, they can say they saw it as well. I mean, maybe they thought someone was messing with them, or maybe they thought it was like a... No, even if it was like a domestic craft, like... Okay, I'm not saying it was a uh, a drone, because I don't know that drones are certainly small... Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Mm. I'm not saying it was a drone, but as an example, if the military saw a drone going around, they might let the police know because it's not really on their level. I'm just throwing out ideas here. But like I said, this was 1980, so I'm not saying it was that. Or they're just warning but the police whether they before they thought it was it something down. that was not to their level or whether they just didn't know what the hell it was so they were calling everyone in a state of panic. Oh, my God! Next we'll hear the fucking fire engines and shit turned up. <laughs> Fireman! <laughs> 
(laughs) (laughs) After daybreak, on the morning of 26th of December, the Air Force returned to the small clearing where they'd seen the object and found. Now, I want you to take this in. They actually found three small impressions on the frozen December ground in a triangular pattern indicating that something weighing tons had been there not long ago. There were also burn marks and broken tree branches on the surrounding trees as if something had taken off, damaging nature as it passed. By 10.30am, the local police were back and examined the indentations which they thought could have been made by an animal. Because obviously we have dinosaurs or Indian forest. And uh, three-legged animals that stand in a tripod formation. <laughs> <laughs> so, they saw... Oh, I, keep, I need to stop saying so. <laughs> you say this every episode and <laughs> never do. Fucking no. <laughs> they saw the light come down. Indeed. And then they saw it go up again. Yeah. So, why are they surprised by the broken tree branches and stuff because they would have seen that surely if they were following the direction that the craft went they may not have stopped to investigate the surrounding area did they not go through that same bit where it was but they were following the craft eyes on the craft like I say they've only now gone back to investigate the path that it's taken and remember this was like 2 to 4 in the morning initially and now it's 10.30 it's light true would have thought they'd had torches but they were following the craft. They're not going to stop and examine the surrounding area. One they're... could look down while the other two are looking forward. <laughs> is that it's what you one do? Set of eyes if there. me and you were chasing a UFO, would you be like, Kev, stop and investigate the ground? Is there only two you of us? Be... <laughs> what, what? Like, there's only two of us. How yeah. many of them are there? Three, I believe. Well, two can run forward. Yeah, but that, that's what I'm saying. Down. You'd be in a state of, like, Panic and excitement Sun. and... Just like that. Kev, it's a UFO. <laughs> well, you're acting like a twat. Go follow it. I'll look down here. See if I can see anything. That's uh, how I'd react. I find that <laughs> highly unlikely. <laughs> You'd be gone. <laughs> it uh, depends what day. So... I'm going to show you a photo of the site which is taken from a book called You Can't Tell the People by Georgina Bruni, a (laughs) British UFO researcher who passed away in 2008. Why is that tickling you? You can't tell the people whilst telling the people. (laughs) (laughs) So the photo isn't great quality as it's been taken from a book and scanned in obviously, but I thought it was important to prove to you that this genuinely happened. Remember, this was December, so the ground would have been frozen until about midday, meaning that after that, chances are the marks would have vanished, which is how we know they were made that night. Here's the photo. And here I thought you were going to bring real evidence. Well, this is, like I say, it's not great quality, but you can see they've marked the indentations in the forest in a sort of clearing as has been described. So what I'm doing right now is laying the foundation. Okay, right. Um, All I can see from this picture is a police officer and another man standing in a field. The picture quality really is bad. So I cannot see any indentations. I can see two little markings where they've apparently marked the indentations. Yeah. Cannot see the third, although I'm assuming... It's to the right, but yeah, yeah, the quality isn't great. As I say, it's been taken from a book, and this is just a document that it actually was officially investigated. Okay. Um, So they checked out this entire scene. Again... It's meant to have burned trees and broken branches, but then I don't know what would have been in that space anyway. Well, there wasn't a fire. How do you know that? There'd be evidence on the ground. You've set a fire before, right? Some fire? Or? Someone oh. could have been camping. like. But there'd be remnants. Mm, that's a good point. I'll let you have that one. <laughs> <laughs> so on the 28th of December, 1980... Lieutenant Colonel (laughs) Charles I. Holt, a well-respected deputy base commander who even has his own Wikipedia page, having received the reports of what had gone down and being told that the craft was back and not believing in UFOs himself, visited the site with several military service people 
to de-escalate the situation. The military took radiation readings in the area of the depressions in the ground using standard US military equipment. Whilst much of the area was at usual background levels, 0.03 to 0.04 millirongens, I think it's like, rongens, millirongens? Why do I do it to myself? Per hour? (laughs) They did detect readings of 0.07, so a slight spike. Mm -hmm. But again, this was just the odd reading here or there. There was another small burst of radiation about half a mile from that site. Holt recorded the findings via narrating on a cassette recorder. During this investigation, whilst narrating, a flashing light was again seen across a field to the east towards a farmhouse, just as the Air Force had seen on the first night. I should add that the lighthouse is also in that direction, although much further east. Holt would add that there were three star-like lights in the sky, two to the north and one to the south, and the brightest of these lights beamed down a beam of light. A beam of light occasionally, almost like it was searching. (laughs) Was it a helicopter? Moving over the base, (laughs) searching, particularly around the weapons storage areas. Again, I reiterate that these were not civilians, they were Air Force. We'll get into the nitty gritty later, but I just want to hammer home that these people worked with the sky and military technology as well as civilian tech. They know what's what. And remember what you said earlier in your initial guesswork, <laughs> were they checking out our weapons storage or <laughs> checking out our defensive Defenses, capabilities? Yep. <laughs> you look like you've um, had a mind spurt. No, I'm just thinking. Um, Don't do that, just go with it. Where the weapons are stored. Yeah. Would you say that that's where the... I wouldn't say best, but the most powerful weapons in the UK, is that where they're going to be stored? So, I I might get into this later on in the probe, but I'll give a very, very brief summary. It's rumoured that there was nuclear tech here. Ah, okay. But obviously it would be top, top secret. Unless you're an alien. (laughs) (laughs) But potentially, this is one of the US's biggest non... Well, in... Europe, potentially. An important place in the 80s. Well, if there's nuclear we- if there's nuclear mm-hmm. weapons there, it's possible that could explain the mini spike in reading, depending on if the weapons were moved through that area. They weren't. So the spikes were in this clearing and then a little bit away, but in the forest itself, which is outside, they left the gate of the base to come into the forest. The roads don't come through the forest, if that makes sense. Fair dues. But when we go to do our little site investigation, you'll be able to see where the military base was, or, well, the, it's still there, but I don't think it's in use. Mm. But you'll see it's quite a, a way away. So we have potential beings that I'm not saying are definitely aliens <laughs> looking for weaponry. <clears throat> one possibility the possibility I was spot on <laughs> off. let's wrap this up although I don't know what it was oh, um, we have got so much more to get through so these three stars in the sky star like they were moving that's true star like did they make any sound at all <laughs> not that's reported no no so sound whatsoever sight. so you'd obviously hear if it was a helicopter yeah or, absolutely or, everything we know of in our technology, makes sound. Nothing in this one did make sound. And like I say, one of them was shining down a beam, so it was obviously moving from area to area. No sound. Do you reckon that I'm going to go out on a whim? I'm Mm -hmm. taking a sharp left here. Do you reckon in 2030, Elon Musk (laughs) discovers time travel and creates... (laughs) A silent Tesla-like craft that takes him back and he just goes searching for nukes or for anything that he finds interesting. Do you know, we're not at the point of (laughs) concluding this one. We're not even close as yet, but we should definitely come back to that when we're summarising our final thoughts (laughs) because that's a bloody good idea. But I don't want to die or get into it further because I'll have to cover things that we haven't yet covered. 
That's true. Or or someone that has hybrid technology because these electric cars are silent. I think twenty and I hate them. Twenty thirty is probably a bit optimistic though. <laughs> maybe twenty eight thirty. Well, but maybe. Regardless, like I say, like, we can come back to that. Just before he dies, he figures it out and goes back to twenty thirty and tells himself <laughs> <laughs> how to do it. <laughs> and therefore he does it then and then goes back. Uh, and and 2030 Elon Musk <laughs> goes back to 1980 <laughs> so evidence from these incidents was made available to the public within three years Holt wrote a memo as I touched upon earlier to the Ministry of Defence two weeks later after investigating himself the memo was not actually classified by, by the MOD hence its public release in 1983 Oh, okay. Holt, following his retirement, has gone on record, however, to state that he categorically witnessed a UFO event, which was then covered up. Holt was not a believer, and at the time he just wanted it to go away with much stigma involved in any UFO case. As soon as you claim UFO or aliens, you were considered a nut. <laughs> Heard Holt, that before. Yep. Holt had a career to think about. So we know that Holt reported this to the MOD... And a couple of weeks later, the British did investigate it somewhat, but publicly made nothing of it. But in addition to knowing this as fact, Holt's cassette recording was released to UFO researchers in 1984. So he categorically witnessed a UFO event. That's what he says. Did he specifically say event? I forget if he used the word event or incident or occurrence, Uh. but something of that nature. Witnessing a UFO and witnessing a UFO event are two different things. But they both involve a UFO. Yeah, that is true. It just means you don't know what it was up there. Yeah. Not that it was aliens. Well, I'm not saying that it was aliens. Good. But it was aliens! <laughs> <laughs> because no, like neither say, am I! <laughs> we're not at that point yet, but what we are saying is that Holt was a very, very genuine, serious man who didn't believe in aliens or UFOs has gone and investigated this, has kept quiet throughout his career. Then, after he's retired, he's come out to say, actually, I did see something here. People need to know about this. Was he well... So he's protected well, his career, and then... Was he well-respected within the military? At that time, yeah, yeah. So he's not one of these people that they just kind of dismiss? Not exactly, but we're going to get on to someone else a bit later who is... <laughs> there's a lot of witnesses in this case and they're all quite genuine people but yeah we're going to get into this more later on we're just going over the incidents for now and what's canon the radiation tests and sightings of lights along with Holt's reactions can be heard in full as they happen on this tape Holt in 2010 and by then retired signed a formal statement under oath outlining what had happened and that in his factual opinion, he believed the event to be extraterrestrial. I debated including the tape here in part, but honestly the cassette audio doesn't translate well to a digital podcast. I've therefore taken a tiny transcript of the tape. (laughs) If you could read this with me, I'll do Holt's lines. He's American, so I'm of course going to opt for an Irish accent. If you could read Officer Neville and Officer England's lines, please, sir. Of course. Glorious. I don't actually have to put an accent on because we're from this region. (laughs) They're American. Oh, you bastard. (laughs) (laughs) I did just say they're American, so I'm going to do an Irish accent. Uh, You said he's American. Yeah, but it's an American airbase. Yeah, but you just said he. So I just assumed only the one you were doing. I said right at the start that... Shut up! (laughs) (laughs) The memory's back. (laughs) Let's get into it. The sample... You're going to mark this sample number one. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> you make me feel. Have them cut it off and include some of that sap and all. It's between indentation two and three on a pine tree about five feet away, about three and a half feet off the ground. Put it in here. I've got some more. There's a round abrasion on the tree about three and a half, four inches in diameter. It looks like it might be old, but uh, strange, it's a crystalline pine sap that has come out that fast. You say 
There is other trees here that are damaged in a similar fashion. Yeah, all facing in towards the center of the landing site. Okay, why don't you take a picture of that? And remember your picture. We ain't gonna be writing this down. Oh, it's gonna be on the tape. You got a tape measure with you? For my dick. This is no time to be doing kid stuff, England. I just need a little light relief. Okay, okay. So I may have added a couple of lines in there, but that's 99% what was said. I selected that section just to evidence that they were calling it a landing site because they knew something had landed despite later following the cover-up story and to also evidence that they took samples of the damage to the surrounding area, which appear to have disappeared. That is the worst transcript we've ever done and possibly the hardest one for me to do simply because you were doing an Irish accent which threw me off completely (laughs) where I I was going. I was like, what voice am I putting on here? And then every time you said something, I just had to say something. I was like, fuck! (laughs) Bitch. So Holt says it was aliens after he retired. Yeah. Yeah, why wouldn't you? I mean, they can't fire you at that point. Exactly. Um, They can't really shit on your name because you've had such a long storied career, or not necessarily storied, but had such a long career. If you were that piece of shit that they would come (laughs) out and say you were, then you would question why they kept you employed for so long. So uh, smart thing in there, Holt. Mm, Yeah. I actually do find Holt quite credible. But the tape goes on to confirm some radiation spikes and heat burns on the trees. The sighting of more strange red and yellow lights in the sky moving towards the group. Notice I say lights, not light. And the farmyard animals, which are actually more likely to be deer, can then be heard going bonkers again. Holt says lights and he and one of the other officers describe seeing pieces of the light shooting off it. I've got a photo here of what the lighthouse used to look like from the forest. Check this just over the chap's shoulder, courtesy of the BBC. So that's the lighthouse in the background at the time. Yeah, there's a chap just stood like he's doing an interview, really. Yeah, which is what it is. And then, obviously, there's just a bright light behind him. So... Is there another picture which will show the lights as well as the lighthouse? No, because that was a sighting at the time and they went out to investigate it. Ah, They didn't have time to get recording equipment together or anything like that. All they had was a cassette recorder. But what we know is they say on they're seeing three or four lights, light shooting off light. But we know this is what the lighthouse actually looked like. Fair point. If you're looking at the lighthouse, for example, yep, and that light is spinning... Mm-hmm. It's not going to be shooting. That, yeah. That's a big difference. Yeah, yeah. They yeah, they would clearly know that. And I think anyone looking at a lighthouse would be able to tell it's a lighthouse. And Especially a bloody Air Force <laughs> person. <laughs> <laughs> An expert in crafts in the sky. Can you imagine if they didn't? And every time they looked up, they just thought the lighthouse was a UFO. They didn't know what a plane was, yet they're working for the... <laughs> Air Force. (laughs) So I've completed this probe and then come back and changed my mind for this section. I think the lighthouse is the perfect cover story. The second sightings work so much in the military's favour to cover this event up. If it had just been a landing, how do they explain that? But now that UFOs have been seen, they can tarnish this with the UFO stigma of the 80s and 90s completely gloss over the fact that the transcript actually details the light moving and pieces coming off it, particularly to the right. Ignore completely the previous night, because as soon as people see UFO, they call bullshit. They call bullshit. The light seen and described in the Holt tape also become stable after a while, rather than pulsating like the lighthouse light would have been. So in addition to the flash, we have two stable lights described as objects dancing with coloured lights on them. Before you give me your thoughts on this bit, let's just read another section from the end of the Holt tape. Again, I'll be Irish Holt. (laughs) (laughs) 305, at about 10 degrees, horizon directly north, we've got two strange objects or half moon shape dancing about. 
with coloured lights on them. At her, guess to be about five to ten miles out, maybe less, the half moons have now turned into full circles, as though there was an eclipse or something there for a minute or two. 3.15, now we've got an object about ten degrees directly south, ten degrees off to the horizon. To the left! To the left, to the left. And the ones to the north are moving. One's moving away from us. Moving out fast. This one on the right's heading away too. They're both heading north. Hey, here comes from the south. He's coming towards us now. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. Colors! This is unreal! The tape ends with an object in the south losing altitude and sending down a light beam, appearing to examine the Woodbridge base. So what do you make of Holt's sightings so far? And remember, this is all recorded on that tape. Mental. Yeah. <laughs> so not only do we have multiple lights dancing in the sky. <clears throat> we were actually little, just doing a little boogie. Dance break. <laughs> <laughs> We're an audio <laughs> podcast. <laughs> We're sat here silently dancing. <laughs> together, but not together. The light beaming down. How, do you know how much area the light covered? So was it like a just a small straight light that came down or? A beam about the size of each storage area. So... It's hard. We're going to go and do a site investigation. Not that we're going to see the storage areas, but it's not just like a tiny beam. It's a full what you'd imagine to be a like a a, helico- beam. a helicopter beam on a craft that's not a helicopter. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ooh. So this cover up. Yep. Actually, are you covering more of the cover up later? Possibly. Yes. Okay. I'll wait. <laughs> Should I move on in that case? Mm-hmm. So there are a few inconsistencies between the tape, Holt's memo, and his later statement, but obviously lots of time, nearly 30 years in fact, has passed and Holt was no doubt under pressure at the time with a life ahead of him. For example, Holt has later described the light beams coming down to his feet, but in the tape, they are seen in the distance appearing to examine the military base. In 2010, the base commander, because remember Holt was deputy, But the commander, Colonel Todd Conrad, provided a statement to David Clark, National Archives consultant, stating that the military saw nothing resembling Holt's description in the sky or on the ground. Conrad later added that Holt should be embarrassed for alleging that his own country, the US and the UK, tried to deceive their own residents. Conrad also said at some point that the whole thing might have been a hoax. Some of the original witness statements from the security patrol have also been tracked down and they basically say that we are following a beam from the lighthouse. Getting murky, isn't it? (laughs) But why would you follow a lighthouse beam and report unexplained lights? You would know it's a fucking lighthouse beam. Let's just stop and think for a second. This was on an Air Force base. There would have been hundreds of witnesses. Why is barely anyone coming forward one way or the other? Also, if Comrade thinks it may be a hoax, why is he mad at Holt for falling for it rather than at the hoaxes themselves? Air Force. These people know what the sky looks like. They know stars. They know landing lights. They know the difference between a craft and a pissing lighthouse. I'm not just saying that to sell my story here. They do. The tape clearly mentions beams as well as lights in the sky, though. Murky. Murky. He's mad at Holt for coming out about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the sense that you get, isn't yep. it? You literally got audio evidence of them seeing beams, and he's like, he didn't see anything. <laughs> they were fucked. Fo- and the rest come out. We were following a lighthouse yeah. with a gun to the back of their heads. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, Comrade, he gives several different reasons, contradicting himself. He's like, they didn't see anything. They did see something, but it was a hoax. <laughs> He can't make his mind up on why it's not real. Yeah, he also says it could have been a hoax. Yeah. <laughs> could it? <laughs> could it have also been real, comrade? <laughs> so Are you mad because he, he aired this dirty man laundry? Is, this man is the American military, isn't he? <laughs> Comrade's own story is that the Air Force police 
spotted five lights which they thought was a downed aircraft. Hold on, hold on. I'm held. Didn't Comrade just say he didn't see shit? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So they thought it was a downed aircraft. Two men tracked the object on foot and came upon a large object sitting atop a tripod with no windows but covered in red and blue lights. Every time the men approached, the ship elevated and moved away. They followed the craft for two hours until it blasted away at absolutely bonkers speed. The next morning, Conrad himself saw the tripod indentations and interviewed the witnesses. Conrad said afterwards that those, those lads saw something, but I don't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to confirm again that this story came from Conrad in 1983. So he's contradicting himself and his witnesses here by saying that they saw nothing. He's saying it wasn't aliens and blaming Holt, but he himself is giving a pretty freaking alien-like description. Uh, Cover up. <laughs> they've got something on him, haven't they? And they've told him to go out there and absolutely bury this story who knows so <laughs> either that or he just hates Holt <laughs> <laughs> Holt doinked his wife <laughs> and now Conrad is, he doesn't care about what happened he just wants to tarnish Holt's name or maybe they um, yeah. they had a pact that they would both go out there and say it together and Holt was like fuck this <laughs> Holt retired <laughs> and he was like I'm blowing the lid off it <laughs> So the Suffolk police logs, because remember, the police attended, don't give any information of note and basically say that the witnesses misinterpreted the lighthouse lights and landing beacons from the air bases in unusual weather conditions. These are air force. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, they know what a lighthouse looks like. So... Let me now introduce you to Sergeant Jim Penniston, one of the three original patrolling officers. The information so far is all documented and verified via so, so many sources. Jim's information, which is plentiful, comes pretty much from Jim himself, who was a direct witness. Someone tracked Jim down in 2010 after his retirement, and following that, he's come out with his story. He's attended several conferences and he's even written a book with not only an explanation of what was seen that night, but his own theory on what it was. Are you ready for Jim? Please don't know shit. <laughs> but at the same time, Jim's written a book. Yep. After he retired. Hmm. I'm sceptical of Jim. <laughs> but then like he said, after he retired, he... Mm. Yeah, and we'll did get on to that as well. Did he need the money? Did he just want it out there? Conferences? Yeah, he's. I mean, he's been military his whole career. He's fairly comfortable. True. Unless they fucked him. <laughs> I don't know why I just got an image of that episode of South Park with um, Steven Spielberg, Spielberg and um, oh. George Lucas. In the- <laughs> So Jim relays the story fairly closely to what we've gone over, so I'll skim the start. Jim was part of the three patrolmen sent to investigate what was believed to be a downed aircraft, but in tracking the lights through the forest, Jim actually saw the craft. Jim is one of the men who definitely saw something Conrad was talking about. Jim had a notebook with him and he scribbled down what he saw. The craft was dark and did not have any exhaust or noticeable noticeable crew department within it. Jim could make out some strange glyphs on the side of the craft and jotted these down in his book. Jim even measures this out. They were close to three feet per glyph. The craft itself was around nine feet in length, about six and a half feet in width and had no wings or rivets as a flying vehicle would have. Jim noticed that the craft was stationary. It was not hovering, but there was also no part of the craft touching the ground. Jim stated that he saw indentations being made in the ground as if by light underneath the vehicle. In filling his formal Insta report in a few days later, Jim went to give the military a full description of what he had seen. The radio operatives informed Jim that whilst he couldn't hear them, they had heard everything he had radioed back. A general had come to pick up these tapes of those radio transmissions and they remain unreleased this day but definitely do exist. Okay, so, I'm calling bullshit. (laughs) On what? 
don't have time to check the original landing point, but somehow <laughs> it's dark and Jim manages to sketch out all this shit and measure it because apparently he got close enough that he could see it. But Remember? then every time they got close, it flew off. So you've got the official line is what I gave originally. And then you've got Jim's own version. So this Jim, mm-hmm. how trustworthy is he? We'll get into all of that. Is he Kevin trustworthy? <laughs> you nodded your head then. I don't believe um, him. Again, I've got my own thoughts about this, but they'll be in the conclusion. You might not have meant to have nodded your head then. <laughs> but you no, I, I meant as in I see where you're coming from, but there is another side to it. But yeah, we're going to get deep in the um. <laughs> I'm not trusting this gym. That's fine, that's fine. I'm not asking you to. I haven't... Three foot per glyph. Yeah, from the description, I wasn't sure if he actually meant three foot between the glyphs or three foot in the total length of the glyphs, but that's how it was written. How many glyphs did he see? We're going to see it, son. Yeah, but I'm just going off of... Oh, yeah, because they would have done that off of his description, wouldn't they? Yeah, they have, yeah. That's true, yeah. So we'll cover that. There it is. After we've seen it. When we've seen it, I shall continue to call bullshit <laughs> on Jim. <laughs> that's that's fine. It's his last name, yeah, McDonald. There are several different takes to this story, like I say, and I've got my own thoughts on what is and what isn't bullshit and whatnot, or what's been elaborated on, and if it has been stretched a little bit shall we say or embellished a little bit i've got About theories the as to why clips. that might be <laughs> but yeah not only did jim see jim approached the craft reached out and touched it the craft felt warm to the touch against the freezing outside temperature and felt smooth like a black glass but then the vehicle took off jim had his whole career ahead of him so after giving his statement in a somewhat protected manner i.e. Jim didn't go into detail other than saying he saw something, Jim stored his notebook containing his detailed account of what had transpired in his home. Jim kept journals every week of his whole Air Force career and kept them all, so Jim didn't even think about what was in the notepad again for many years. Until... That's where we're leaving it for today. Fucking Jim. (laughs) Fucking Jim. (laughs) <laughs> I've got so much more on Jim So Did Did the other two see him touch this thing? We'll get into all of that Is, uh, On next week's episode <laughs> Fuck you <laughs> Fuck Jim oh, Jim's a prick There's so much more Oh for fuck's sake <laughs> Fucking Jim <laughs> Just you wait <laughs> Honestly, there's just so, so much. <laughs> so, this was... I'm not saying that I believed it, but I believed that something... Yeah. They saw something, something yeah. happened. Jim has totally pushed me onto the fen- onto the side of the fence of this is bullshit. What I would say is you've got the official line, the sensible line, and Jim's Jim. line. <laughs> and I'm not asking you to believe all three. We'll conclude on what is and isn't true at the end of the next episode like I say but I've got a lot more to go into including Jim conspiracy theories other explanations okay official line Mm mhm put out line Mm mhm Jim's (laughs) is bullshit but yeah I'm I'm gonna open your eyes even further on Jim though there's more to it just keep that in mind but what's going to happen now, Granville, is that we are going to complete an on-site investigation at Rendlesham Forest, just like I explained at the start. Then next week, we're going to come back, cover what was in Jim's book, discuss our views on what we've seen, and look at alternative theories before we form our conclusion on how this was definitely aliens. Until then, thank you to listening to But It Was Aliens. Sorry, I just have one question before we finish. Is Jim still alive? Yes. Good. Because if this is bullshit, I'm tracking Jim down, I'm going to fuck him up. That's so mean. He's just trying to get the truth out there. Is he, though? Is he, though? He might. But is he, though? (laughs) 
So I've been your host, Kevin the Grey. He still is Granville Moonwalker. You can find us on the socials, as we always say. We're on the Twitter and Facebook at But It Was Aliens. On the Twitter? <laughs> so the truth is up there somewhere. To dig it out, you have to do a little hashtag. Probe. Probe.